Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buddhist Centre Online podcast with me, Chandra Dasa. And it's lovely to be back with a kind of special episode this week, which I'll tell you more about in a minute. But first of all, I hope you're well. I hope your loved ones are well. And of course, in the middle of a pandemic, if things are difficult, I hope you've got the support you need. That's one of the reasons to have this podcast, just to help people stay connected to a worldwide community that you're also part of. Today's a special episode because it's one of our occasional pilot episodes introducing a series of live events. Some of you may remember last year, we had a brilliant series of live discussions, conversations, sharings of inspiration, I suppose, between Paramananda and Viveka, focused mainly on meditation, but of course, with poetry into the nature of love and practice itself. And I'm delighted to say we're kind of testing the ground for a, a follow-up series with Paraman and a, and a series of guests, which we're hoping to call Sources of Inspiration. And we thought we'd get the ball rolling with a special podcast introduction with a very special first guest, somebody I was going to say well-respected or member, but actually that doesn't really cover it. I think much loved would be a much better description of Attila, who's based in London. We'll say hello to Attila in a minute, but first I just want to greet Paramanda. Hey, Paramanda, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you, Chanda. So, yeah, looking forward to doing these conversations. How's West London this pandemic week? It's the new normal, isn't it, now? So, here, so it's kind of quite quiet, quite like it in a way, cold and quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Great. And welcome to you too, Atala. Lovely to have you with us. It's been a long time since I've seen you personally, and it's delightful to have you on my Zoom screen on a Saturday morning in, in wintry New Hampshire. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, before I get Paramananda to explain a bit more about what these conversations will be, I'm just curious, Atala, as to why you said yes. Why did you say yes to being interviewed on the radio? <laughs> well, I'm aware that I haven't really done anything <laughs> for a long, long time, and I'm not inclined to do anything. So it's kind of working against my tendency, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. Well done, you. And Paramananda, yeah, perhaps you could kind of give the audience a bit of an introduction to these conversations. I know you and I planned a retreat together, which you just finished leading, the Alchemical Heart on the Buddhist Centre Online, and it was a really big success. And in the set-up conversations, this idea emerged about sources of inspiration. So could you tell us a bit more about how you see these conversations going and why they might work in a way as a series of live events? Well, I think the germ of it really was the one that I myself did last year. Just so enjoyable having a conversation with her and just seeing you know, what kind of unraveled from that. And so I think building on that, I thought it would be very good to just get people that I know into conversation and what I'm hoping is going to happen is that I wanted to explore what inspires and keeps these people going like Attila you know he's been at it for probably getting on for 50 years now and I'm interested in both why they do that and what sustains them in that endeavor and our so-called spiritual life and what other influences have shaped the way they practice, the way they teach, the way they live, really. So really, I'm hoping it's just going to be an exploration of, in a way, a life, you know, a life involved with Buddhism and other areas of interest. So that's the basic idea. And just the conversation with people that I have regard for and have been important to me in one way or another. With Attila, I was thinking about it this morning. I've known Attila for about 40 years now. He was on the first ever Buddhist retreat I went on, and I've known him ever since. And it's one of the people that attracted me to this particular Buddhist tradition, what we used to call the Western Buddhist Order, now Tri Ratna. And that was the first Buddhist group I had anything to do with. And that first retreat was the first thing I ever did with that group. And he was there on that first retreat as a particular group of people there. And it was actually the people more than the practices, if you like, that made me think, oh, maybe this is something I could be involved with. And now I've been involved with it for 40 years. So it's sort of exploring the life, you know, 
what it means to be involved in this particular Buddhist decision and spend one's life, really, within it, yeah. I think that sort of sums it up, really. That sounds promising, intriguing, and I suppose, well, it's quite a sort of tender space, isn't it? Like holding that long-term intimacy with people and just being willing to show up in public and witness to it, be present with it. Very beautiful. It was one of the loveliest aspects of watching you and Vivek, I remember, last year, was just the evidence of your friendship and what that allowed people into when they just came to spend time, spend an hour. So I'm very pleased to have Attila here for the first of these conversations. Well, what I hope will be the first of a series of conversations. As I've already said, I've known Attila for getting on for 40 years. He was one of the first Buddhists that I ever met. And he was someone that I immediately felt some kind of, I suppose I identified with him to a certain extent. He was like myself, a kind of working class Englishman in what is largely, it must be said, middle class domain on the whole. Perhaps that doesn't matter, but anyway, (laughs) at the time it mattered to me, someone that I felt I could relate to. And also someone who over the years I found that I've shared a lot of interests, influences with, and maybe we'll touch upon some of them in the conversation someone that I felt empathy of influences and ideas with and been lucky enough to work together on numerous occasions over the years. So I'm very happy to have him. Perhaps it's worth saying, though this will probably come out in the conversation, but it's worth saying that Attila has spent his Buddhist life around the London Buddhist Centre, which is the largest of the Buddhist centres in England. And he's been a very important figure in that community for a very long time now. And he has a practice as a psychotherapist. I think that's the right term. You'll correct me in a minute if it's not. And although his clientele isn't exclusively Buddhist, I know it has been largely people from the Buddhist community. He must have seen many hundreds of them over the years. So he's got a very particular perspective on that side of things. And he's had a large influence on the movement in some of the ideas he's brought into the movement and his approach. Yeah, I'm delighted to have him here. I'm going to ask all the guests to bring along a little bit of writing or a poem or whatever, which they find inspiring, have found inspiring, and we're going to use that as a kind of springboard and see what unfolds from that little bit of material that they bring along. So I know Athel has brought along a poem. Well, I think it's a poem he knows by heart. He's a bit like me. He learns things by heart, and I think this is one of the poems that he knows by heart. So... I'm just going to ask Attila to recite that when he's ready. Oh, thank you. It's been an honour to know you, actually. Yeah. The poem is one of Keats's poems. It's not so well known, but it has a particular significance for me in that I read it back in, I think it was about 1979. I was reading a biography of Keats, and it's this particular poem that struck me at the time because it was quite a dark period of my life, as it were. So I'll tell you the poem and then perhaps we can kind of see where it goes from there. The poem is called To a Song Thrush. O thou who's felt the winter's wind, whose eye a sin the snow clouds hung in mist, and black elm tops amongst the freezing stars, to thee the spring will be a harvest time. O thou whose only book has been the light of supreme darkness, which thou feddest on night after night when Phoebus was away, to thee the spring will be a triple morn. O seek not after knowledge, I have none, and yet my song comes native with the warmth. O seek not after knowledge, I have none, and yet the evening listens. He who saddens at the thought of idleness cannot be idle, and he is awake who thinks himself asleep. 
So, yes, if you had asked me at the time why it had such an impact on me, I don't think I would have been able to articulate it. But I think it adds particular relevance to today, really. It comes from a letter that he's writing to his friend Reynolds, and he's talking of, well, he's decided to give his life basically to poetry, but he has not much money. And in this case, he's writing to his friend saying he spent a morning on the Hampstead Heath. And in one part, he's reflecting on the spider and how it gives out and things come back. So he's looking at the responsiveness around him. And then he lights on the bee with the flowers. And he's saying, well, in a world in which there's so much emphasis put on the business of the bee and the doing of the bee, It's the flower, which is also very, very important in the sense that it opens itself to receive both and to give. And then he goes into a few lines, well, he's spending this time in idleness. And then it seemed to be that whether he was feeling guilty at that time or perhaps thinking that he's idle bugger. But then the song thrust seems to say to him to then go into this poem. It's a whole thing about being in harmony with the natural world around him, but also living with that tension, which I know very much, of doubting oneself. But in a sense, that doubt comes from a source, and it's trying to understand to be able to live with that tension where creativity comes out of. Yeah, so it's meant a lot to me over the time, and it keeps coming back to me at particular times. I don't know whether people would want to know. It's a particular time just after I finished when we were working on the centre in Bethnal Green and we had gone up to Wales to work with the derelict buildings, what became now known as Badraloka, but we had so few resources and on top of that we got snowed in and I don't think I've ever toiled so much to achieve so little during that period. So it was a bit of a hell really for a while. <laughs> And it was in the middle of that that I was reading this biography at night time. Yeah. Quite a lot to start with. (laughs) Thanks very much after that. I mean, it reminds me, of course, back in those days, you were highly valued for your carpentry, weren't you? Yeah. Always keen to get you to help build Buddhist centres, weren't they, and retreat centres. Yeah. And then somehow I found myself up in Wales straight afterwards. (laughs) I'm not quite sure how that happened. (laughs) <laughs> the poem seems to be about coming out of the darkness in a way, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's quite interesting to me that your role within the movement, in a sense, became helping people work with their darkness in a way. Do you think that's a fair way of putting it? Uh, yes, it was a way of working to start with with my own darkness that took me to it in the first place, yeah. And I must say that I had a reflection that I had been practising for, by that time, 10 years, and there was something that I just wasn't getting to. So I thought I needed to turn in a particular direction to explore that. So that's how it came about. And I thought, well, if I hit those periods, I'm sure other people will. It's not in spite of your practice, it's more or less coming out of it that you hit those dark moments. Or some people do, not all people, but it does seem that some people do hit periods after practising for quite a time that something emerges that they haven't found a way through, as it were. And I think it can be useful for people to explore that. I've tended to look around other places and I think one of the people that I've found most helpful in that regard of understanding that is Hillman, where he talks about looking at the symptom of something to actually understand the symptom as that tension between something that is vital importance to remember and yet is too painful to remember. So I think it's that tension that's important people at certain points find themselves needing to explore. Maybe we can come back to Hillman in a minute because James Hillman, as you know, has also been a very big influence on myself and uh, would quite like to explore that in a bit more detail. But before we do that, I just wonder if you remember, this is a long time ago, probably about 
87, I would imagine. You were leading one of the LBC's summer retreats. We did a number of them together, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And this was one that you led. And even this was before you trained as a psychotherapist. You always seem to have this empathy with people that were going through difficulties, were in a dark place, and you would always give them your time and attention, and people would respond to you in quite an extraordinary way, actually. And I remember saying to you on this retreat, I don't know if you remember, because you had to spend a long time with various people, and I said to you, look, Arthur, if you're going to do that, you should get paid for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the point I want to make is I remember you used to just sort of say to people, how are you? And they would sort of break down in tears. You know, there was something about you. There's always been something about you that allowed people to contact this difficult material in them or at least express it. You know, this amazing human empathy that you have for people that are suffering. Do you know where that comes from? Because as I say, it predates your training, doesn't it? I remember being told when I was young, I was a bit of a slow beginner and apparently I didn't speak till I was three mm. and I just used to look at people. <laughs> so wherever it comes from now, I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps I was thinking, what the hell am I? <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> but I've always had a thirst to understand somewhere. Yeah, it comes from an intense wanting to understand why people do certain things and behaviour. You've already brought up something that I was very interested in exploring a little bit. And actually it comes out in James Hillman's work as well, because James Hillman isn't necessarily particularly complimentary about meditation, is he, in his writing? Oh, no. But I think that's mainly because I think he's really trying to understand the soul, isn't he? What he calls the soul. And I suppose perhaps we need to explain what we mean by that. But the way he talks about it, it's, it holds the tension between spirit and matter. Mm. And uh, I think he saw meditation as a way of moving too quickly to transcending mm. something that was vitally important. But he wouldn't have talked in terms of development and growth, but for someone to come into their full sense of themselves, I think, more looking at those areas in life, in the pathology of things, rather than going to the extreme heights, as it were. Yeah. Quite interesting, because he used to quote, Plotinus quite a lot and Plotinus certainly has a spiritual perspective but he tended to not go for that part of him he's more interested in what he called the soul perspective it's a tricky word this soul isn't it yeah. I think in more recent years played quite a resonant and important part in Sri Ratna you know more and more people are attracted by this idea of soul I see as value in the descent as much as the ascent. Could we say that? Mm -hmm. It's valuing something that you teach a lot is actually staying with the tension, mm -hmm. staying with the tension between. So when you're meditating and as you meditate, well, things do emerge, don't they? So we can get into denial or sort of try to avoid it or whatever. And it's important to hold that tension somewhere to allow what is potential and of value that's within that tension, yeah. I think perhaps in addition, soul kind of speaks to what's most human in us. It means to be in the world in a very visceral, tactile way, doesn't it? That tension, it does seem it's not to make one good and one bad, but spirit tends to want to move away from the world, whereas soul, you can look at it in a sense, it doesn't want to move away from the world, it wants to come into the world, as it were. And we're talking about it as a thing, but it's obviously not a thing. It's a way of looking at things rather than an actual object or such. That's the sort of quality of things. Yeah. We recognise it, don't we, when we hear music or even food or architecture. Some things immediately, we have that response to them, don't we, or nature. Yeah. You see a big old oak tree or something, and it's somehow soulful, it's somehow got depth, doesn't it, and that quality to it. Character, I suppose, is another... Another way of looking at it, yes. Yeah. yeah. A bit knocked about usually, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the rough edges are showing, as it were.
I wonder after all these years, I suppose it does interest me to what extent, even as a movement, Buddhist movement, we tended at times to emphasize what we're calling spirit or the ascent and how much that's still there in people's practice. I've often thought that actually many people begin meditation practice because they want to rise above their psyche in a way or rise above the difficult aspects of their psyche. And I think all of us in the end have to go through them rather than rise above them. Does that make sense? Yes, I think that's true, yeah. Partly, I think we've all been there, haven't we? When you're in pain, you want to get away from it. But then in some ways, the methods we use to get away from pain actually increase it, as it were. So I think it's, as you say, getting to a certain point where you have to turn and look at what it is that keeps repeating and that you're not listening to. Yeah, I'm sure the movement as a collective has been like that. It'd be surprising if it hadn't, because I think that is that natural tendency in the world. It's a spirit of the age, as it were. It's very much one of power over, isn't it? Like power over nature, the power to control nature. And somewhere we've lost the ability to be in harmony with the natural world, haven't we? I think all these things are very, very important, really. And I think we've all been caught in wanting to get away from painful experience. Yeah. Well, this is at the core of Buddhism in a way, isn't it? Yeah. We want to move away. Yeah. I suppose it's to what extent do we use meditation to abide with and come into relationship with these more difficult aspects, sometimes refer to them as our dark materials after Philip Pullman, but to what extent do we use meditative practice to do that or to what extent do we use it in an attempt to get away from it? And this is quite a sort of delicate balance, isn't it? Mm. Can you say a little bit about what drew you in? Well, you trained in psychosynthesis, didn't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. Why did you choose that particular methodology? My main reason for choosing that is that it included the emphasis on the imagination, really, because I was always interested in myth and ritual. So that was part of what drew me towards psychosynthesis that it included a spiritual perspective of the human being. And it talks about being a biopic vision of when you see someone, you see not only the pathology, but also the potential for spirit as well. You're looking at them from both perspectives. So that's why I chose that particular tradition, as it were. I'm reminded of Blake, which of course is another one of your great loves, isn't it, William Blake, his idea of double vision. Yeah. When did you first come across Blake? I first come across Blake when I was working in Greek Street in a homeless shelter. One of the people that worked there, Pat Bradley, she used to leave all sorts of books laying around and uh, happened to pick up the Songs of Innocence and Experience from Blake. And that certainly engaged me and interested me at that time. Were you already interested in poetry or was that...? Not really, not really, because I hadn't really come from that... I think the most profound book I read before I was about 27 was Mickey Spillane. He was even cruder than Chandler's Marlowe. Do you know them books, Mickey Spillane? I'm not sure I ever read any of it. I I read quite a few of them when I was a kid. (laughs) Well, no, did I read quite a few? I read a few of them, yeah. But no, I wasn't much good at school. I certainly wasn't very well educated, yeah. So it's all come later in life that I discovered these people. And I must say, that's what drew me to the FWBO as it was then. It wasn't so much Buddhism, I don't think, if I was to be honest. It was more listening to a man who had a breadth of knowledge that could draw things. I think that was the drawing power. Today, I think I'm more eclectic, disciplined, tend to draw things from all sorts of places, Yeah. That was something quite exciting, wasn't it? Sangaracha to having this sense that Western culture, the Western philosophical and poetic tradition was important and we had to find a way of expressing Buddhism within this culture, our culture. I know that was one of the things that certainly attracted me. Yeah, I think that's true. Certainly that's what attracted me at that time. Do you have any reflections on how that's gone? 
as a project. I sometimes wonder if we've slightly lost that project or, you know, it seemed very clear. I mean, I must say personally, just a personal thing, I was rather sad when we changed our name from the Western I, Buddhist. So was I, yes, yes, yeah. I thought the whole vision of the order being somehow a spiritual core or attempting to be, having something to work through into the world with the friends of the Buddhist order, I think that's kind of described what I would call the metabolizing of the soul, really. It's the descent of, I suppose, the spirit, in a sense, materializing into the world. Yeah. yeah. I like that idea, and I think we've kind of lost it. Mm. Well, some of it, we are trying to keep it alive, aren't we? <laughs> I do think it was very inspiring to feel that one was engaged in that kind of project. And uh, it's very important that we don't lose that, that we are, to my mind at least, still in the early stages of trying to find a Buddhism that's relevant to the contemporary world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I liked about those early retreats that you were talking about. At that time, it was the LBC trying to set retreats up where people come in off the street, as it were, more or less raw, with no knowledge of Buddhism and yeah, engaged with it. It was quite a formative project. And I'm a bit sad that it's kind of got centralised now because part of the fun of it, the inspiration of it, was that we would go to some school or some place down by the seaside or wherever and we would actually go there as a team and create something in the middle of it, a whole shrine, and invite people in. And that was quite a formative period of developing those retreats. Some of that spirit's been lost, I think. As we get older and we get more sophisticated, because it was quite crude as well, wasn't it, if you remember? (laughs) When you were saying that, I was thinking of slightly more nomadic, wasn't it? You sort of went down there, set something up, and then you left. I think there's a saying within the Sufi tradition that you do your work and then you leave no trace, which I've always quite liked. You do the spiritual work or whatever it is, and then that's it, you're gone, you know. Mm. But of course, there are lots of advantages in being a bit more rooted in having more developed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about that. There's more people around, aren't there? There's more very good teachers around. At those days, it was all the blind leading the blind a bit, wasn't it? But well, some magical came out of it. Yeah. So over the years, you've done all sorts of different things. Particularly, you've done individual therapy with must be hundreds of Buddhists. Mm. You've also perhaps more than anybody established and maintained a kind of tradition of working in groups. Yeah, in- no, I've been very fortunate to be able to develop something. I've enjoyed it. It's been very creative, actually. It's group work, but working with kind of, in a sense, the handrail of fairy stories and myths and also working with dreams. That's where the passion has been mainly working with the dreams in that kind of context collectively, I think is very important. You arrive on a retreat and working, people are having experiences and somehow, you know, that coming, showing up at night time and coming into their dreams. It's almost as though the dream is the mind of the body speaking, as it were. When it works, it works very well, I think. I've done quite a bit with that over the years. One of the things that I'm very interested in, which I think overlaps with you, I know it does, is this idea that we have a kind of individual psyche, but we also seem to have a collective psyche. And on a retreat, this emerges quite strongly, doesn't it, sometimes? There seems to be a kind of collective element going on. And we participate, if we can use this language, in psyche. Mm. I suppose it's using, actually really encouraging, as you have done so, encouraging people to see the body, not just in terms of a personal thing, but it's also collective, isn't it? It's a body of the world. When we are in the body of the world, and we do reflect it, and its concerns reflect through us. So it's encouraging that much, much more, that harmony with both the body as personal body or personal soul, and also collective soul, as it were, the soul of the world. Mm. I find those ideas quite inspirational, really. Yeah. And of course, myth speaks to this, doesn't it? That somehow seems to cut through or across culture and perhaps even individual 
psychological condition into something deeper in us, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. You can see that happening on a retreat, can't you? Where those elements do come in that someone will have a dream and it seems to speak to the collective and even beyond that to the world where we find ourselves, as it were. I was kind of thinking that in terms of COVID and I thought, well, James Hillman's not around anymore, but I wonder how he would have approached it. And if you take what is the symptom, it seems to attack the lungs, doesn't it? It attacks that capacity to breathe, to take in, to kind of harvest, to assimilate, and then give out to the world. And I wonder, seeing the potential within it, somewhere it's telling us we are out of harmony with the natural world. I don't know what you think about that. Looking at the symptom, as it were, archetypally, it does seem to attack the lungs and even cut off the life force, doesn't it, in its worst extreme state. I've had very similar thoughts about it, really, that it seems to be a reflection of a general state of being disconnected. I mean, yeah. it's through the breath that we're most intimately connected to the world, isn't it? And yeah, uh, most intimately connected with the world, connecting with other, and yet that seems to get attacked. I suppose even more generally... Given the ecological situation we find ourselves in, where we've got to the point of actually risking permanently and radically damaging the world. And denying it at the same time, in some cases, yeah, the impact of the human being on the natural world. This speaks to our alienation from, doesn't it? This separated ourselves out so much. I think one of the main concerns for me these days is how can we use practice, meditation, or whatever it is, dialogue, meditation, how can we use this to bring us back into that relationship with the world? Mm. What role can meditation play in that? Mm. Mm. It does seem to be pointing to the fact that we need to unhook from the spirit of power over to mutuality, being in relationship. I suppose, and looking to the future, perhaps that's the potential that will come out of it. Perhaps people will finally start realising just how alienated we have come from the natural world around us. Well, it's all very depressing at the moment, isn't there? There's apparently more deaths through alcohol, there's more suicides and there's more abuse of children. It does seem as though people are crying out to be able to go to some depth in themselves to be able to be with this experience. Otherwise, people just get cut off and lonely and go. It's a bit of a mess, isn't it? But there is a potential within that. And I suppose we've been fortunate in a sense that we've got some idea of practice to go to some depth in the middle of all this. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Certainly. We've got some kind of context, haven't we, both emotionally and intellectually, or however you want to put it, yeah, yeah. that could make some sort of, if not sense, can support some kind of inquiry, I suppose, some kind of exploration. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I wonder what optimism do you have? Do you see things to be optimistic about? (laughs) I hope that something will emerge, things like the demonstrations against the use of nature. Then also, I think Black Lives Matter. I felt quite a lot of hope. Also, the other thing I did, I had a jab the other week. And I found it quite a heartwarming experience seeing all the volunteers and people how they were helping each other out. And, you know, it was really heartwarming. And it took me back to a memory of when I was a kid when all of eastern England was covered in a flood. I was eight years old at the time. And I remember waking up in the morning and seeing the greeny, dark, browny water flapping at the side of the stairs and then going out to look out the window and seeing all the people in the street hanging out their windows, inquiring how they were and all this. <laughs> and I just think it's something about crisis that brings out something in people that is there. And unfortunately, it soon disappears. But there is hope that is there in all of us, that capacity to be aware of the other and to care. Yeah, so I'm hopeful. And I hope that we will start to turn to look to how we are actually, in a sense, damaging the world, damaging nature. I suppose I am 
rather intrigued. Obviously, I wouldn't want you to talk about any individual cases, but as a person that's probably worked most psychologically, intimately within Sri Ratna, well, it must be hundreds of people, yeah? If there's any reflections you have on the potential hazards of the so-called spiritual life, this practice that we're trying to do. I'd have to generalise a bit, I think. Well, there's a number of things, and I think I would have to open myself up to being questions about them, but it has become quite strong and centralised, as you say. And just with younger older members in the world that we live in, it's so concentrated on mind that it can take a long time for people to recognise the importance of the body. And you can get quite a way into meditation, and you're more or less doing it from the head, as it were. And a large part of people is being left out. I think also, I'm always very wary of how much we become an institution. We create criteria through which, in a sense, we view people. It's a lens, a view that we have. And I think sometimes, a lot of times, I think, some individuals certainly get caught in that sort of way of perceiving people through an ethical perspective and not really taking into account what the individual is bringing and struggling. And sometimes I think some individuals who can be seen as quite difficult get read in a particular way and don't really benefit from people moving a bit closer and understanding. Yes, we're forming a lens through which we're perceiving people. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you think about that, but I think that can trap us, trap and also perhaps cut us off from some very talented, creative individuals that don't quite fit into the mould. When you were saying that, what came to my mind, when Sangha was still active and ordaining people, he had a bit of an eye for the maverick sometimes, didn't he? (laughs) Yes, he did. He would ordain some people that would mystify everybody else. (laughs) Yeah. And of course, he could do that. It's a bit harder for us to do that now, isn't it? bit more formalised, I suppose, as it probably has to. Mm. He could get away with it. Because he set it all up, the sort of thing. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever read it, the book Norfolk Fry, The Critical Path. And he's looking at literature, and his whole perspective is, within any society, within anything, there needs to be what he calls the myth of authority, that which carries the tradition. And alongside that, there needs to be the myth of freedom. And he talks, he says, well, the myth of freedom in itself is not a myth. It's only in relationship to the myth of authority. I suppose what he means like that, that the myth of freedom has always got to be there to keep revitalising the myth of authority or the myth of concern, whichever way we want to get. So both are vital, as it were. Somewhere you need to have both in relationship to each other. And I think perhaps... Sometimes we've got the anarchic parts of the movement that somehow get left outside of it. And in a sense, they have a vital part to play as the myth of authority has as well. That's right. There has to be this sort of dynamic tension between the two, doesn't there? Yeah, yeah. The more sort of left field stuff is yeah. probably where at least a lot of the real creativity comes. And yeah. that has to be in relationship to the more oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, institutional authorities. You saw that happening with Butterfield. That went kind of in reaction to the main centre, didn't it? And it spent its time away but in a sense it then came back into the yeah. fault and enriched and that's what happens with a number of individuals they drift off don't they they have to do it and in some ways perhaps that's what needs to happen yeah. as long as they can come back and be integrated into the whole as it were well in a way we could say that's what's happened in your life to some extent isn't it i remember you going into psychosynthesis and training as a purpose and i wasn't necessarily met with universal um, <laughs> some saw you as a sort of maverick or what's that got to do with buddhism we don't want this psychological yeah. yeah well first told me how they felt betrayed by me no it's quite a difficult period that yeah. And you have moved back in, haven't you? And I think most people would say a very positive influence on the movement. I hope so. I hope so, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, well, maybe we should wrap it up there, after. It's been a delight to speak to you. So thanks so much for agreeing to do this. No, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been an opportunity to spend some time with you, although it's online. But we don't see each other enough. And thank you. You've been very important to me. Yeah. Well, likewise, after that, yeah. likewise. Yeah. Maybe we can do it again, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to add my own thanks to Atla for being willing to come online today, venturing out into the great wilderness or practice realm of Zoom, whichever one it feels like today. I don't know if it's a pure land or a hell realm. Zoom can be a bit of both sometimes. If you've enjoyed today's conversation with Paramount, then the good news is that we're going to be doing more of them online and you're invited. So please, if you haven't signed up for the email newsletter for the Dharma Toolkit, you can go to the buddhacenter.com forward slash toolkit and sign up there and we'll send you an email notifying you when these events will be happening. Should be from March through to April and you'll get to come and take part, be a witness to these kinds of conversations. We hope you've enjoyed today's, I was going to say wandering, maybe that's not quite the right word, I was going to say wandering through what it is to be in a spiritual community with other people, the dangers and the hopes, particularly through the years. It's great to have the company of Parliament and Atla to just remind us of where we came from and the kind of work that goes on in communities that this is to form and reform. So thanks to you, Atla, for being willing to, to show up on the podcast. I can't see any of you, but thank you. Yeah, I hope you're all well. Yeah, yeah. Keep well, keep safe. Yeah. And thanks to you too, Paramanda, for just, you know, being brilliant, turning up, having the idea and being willing to invite your friends and letting us join you. Well, thank you, John Dasa, for making it possible and all the work you do to provide this platform, which, you know, is in more need than ever in these particular times. But it's been a pleasure and hope people enjoy this conversation and the ones to follow. So, yeah, it just remains to remind you as ever that you can meditate with other people every day online, if you like, if you go to the Dharma Toolkit. Again, you can click on meditation six days a week twice a day and all these beings just show up in a space like this light up the pixels on their computer screen smile at each other and then sit in silence there's no teaching it's just invited to come into the space and be together it's kind of amazing it's kind of amazing you get beamed off of satellites and bounced off of stars and you get to sit with people in other countries that's cool so you can sit with us any day you can listen out for more of these podcasts and particularly you can look at the live events that we've got on just trying to keep a sense of what it is to have a community through a pandemic the buddhacenter.com live you will find courses and classes you'll find some home retreats just ways to go deeper and stay connected and yeah otherwise please look after yourself please look after each other to the extent that we can online bear each other in mind if nothing else Just practice that and we'll be back soon with more conversations from the community. But for now, goodbye.